Hello. Okay, I'm going to demonstrate to you how discussion about the latest drive for iconoclasm, in this case, to do with white images um, in churches, it can give you brain damage. But not before I make mention of Lewis Carroll's uh, story, Alice Through the Looking Glass, which, by the way, was the only way the Victorians referred to mirrors. And according to the writer Jilly Cooper, uh, you're upper class only if you still do. However, on to church iconography and Alice. I found that not as many people have read Alice Through the Looking Glass as have read Alice in Wonderland. I suspect this second story wasn't as popular as the first. Um, well, because it's actually a lot more intellectual and discusses a lot more topics surrounding, mm, well, philosophy and logic and the nature of reality and, and, and so on. However, as I keep saying, uh, when we call people geniuses, uh, it's because they can see further than the rest of us. And in this case, Lewis Carroll, poor fellow, who wanted more than anything else to be remembered as a mathematician, um, turns out to have predicted the looking glass world of the 2020s, um, well, in far more accurate ways than anyone could possibly have imagined. Carroll's so story starts uh, with Alice sitting by the fire on a warm, but I suppose rainy afternoon, uh, when she starts speculating on what the world would be like on the other side of the mirror, which was positioned on the wall above the fireplace. Victorian houses, if they could afford it, all had huge mirrors over the fireplace. Uh, this wasn't just for aesthetics. It was for two really practical reasons. First of all, it would help reflect the meagre light from the windows or the gas or oil lamps on the walls. But also, since there was often quite a bit of smoke coming out of the fireplace, especially when the fire first started, it would be easier to keep clean uh, you know, to keep a mirror clean uh, than wallpaper or paint. Some of you may have actually seen Victorian fireplaces in antique shops, complete, usually wooden units with mirrors actually in the, the construction above and a shelf over the very top. That shelf wasn't there because they wanted somewhere to put the aspidistra. It would actually encourage any smoke to return back down and not end up on the ceiling. In more opulent houses where the ceilings were very high, they'd have huge mirrors that went all the way up. And in the Tenniel illustration, which I'll put up here, Alice seems to be living in that sort of house. So she climbs onto the mantle and goes through the mirror. And the first thing she finds is a set of chess pieces in the fireplace. From then on, the whole book is a series of chess moves in which Alice is a pawn who survives the game, makes it to the other side of the chessboard and becomes a queen. If you haven't read the book, you should. I would recommend Martin Gardner's edition, uh, which is The Annotated Alice. I'll leave a link in the description to a copy of the Norton edition of that. I don't know whether it's still in print, but there are dozens of others and you'll find a copy somewhere, perhaps even one online. Anyway, let's get back to the main event, which is the sudden realization I had that not only are we in a looking glass world, but we actually do have some of the same characters bobbing about here, as opposed to in the book. In this case, we have a white bishop and a black king. Agreeing with each other. The king to whom I am referring is Sean King. And some of you, especially in the USA, will be familiar with him. For those of you who are not, this is Sean King. 
uh, and he got into the media as Sean King, a pale-skinned black man who talked about next to nothing but race and how he and his people were so cruelly uh, oppressed. And it made him a good living. <laughs> then someone found a picture of his parents and him. Here's mummy and daddy and here's little Sean. Cute kid. Hmm. And it turns out that Mr King is about as black as Rachel Dolezal. Oh, we, we may be into other territory here. Who is Rachel Dolezal? Some of you may be asking. Well, this is Rachel Dolezal's mummy. And this is Rachel Dolezal's daddy. And this is Rachel Dolezal at the age of 15. And here is Ms. Dolezal when she was head of the Spokane chapter of the NAACP, the uh, National Association for the Advancement of Coloured People. Mm. Until she was rumbled, of course, whereupon she did finally step down. But her explanation, she identifies as black. Well, I, I identify as a six foot blonde, but that never helped me make it in the movies. OK, to proceed with my looking glass game of chess. Back to Mr King. His excuse was as follows. He doesn't just identify as black. No, he actually is black. His mother had an extramarital affair with a black man. Uh, which caused some wag at the time to make the comment that the guy just has to be white, uh, as only a white man would throw his mother under the bus so decisively. Now, in any sane universe, King would have been dropped from the media world as quickly as a straight-from-the-oven chunk of hot cornbread. But this isn't a sane universe. Remember, we're in the looking glass world. And King still gets the respect due to him as a black man. Although, honestly, I don't know how anyone can lay claim to being black, even given the extramarital affair with a white mother and this supposed light-skinned black man who was, even if he existed, only half black at best and perhaps even less than that. Frankly, calling the child of such a union black strikes me, well, as the height of racism. Uh, but of course, my opinion doesn't run mainstream now, does it? Uh, crikey, I keep getting diverted here. So, Mr King is still a media darling and they pretend to buy his biography and rush to report his pronouncements as enthusiastically as any devoted courtier. And in this case, Mr King's pronouncement was thus. Every church painting, every statue of Jesus, every stained glass window that depicts Jesus as a white man should be removed. Uh, this is the tweet. I think statues of the white European they claim is Jesus should also come down. They are a form of white supremacy, always have been. In the Bible, when the family of Jesus wanted to hide and blend in, guess where they went? Egypt, not Denmark. Tear them down. Tear them down, eh? Now, there's a word for that. Let's think. What would that be? Ah, oh, yes. Desecration. Oh. Ah, that's the word. Let's just consider his comment about Egypt. Leaving aside the problems of somebody getting to Denmark from Judea at that time in history, let's think why they went to Egypt. They went to Egypt because it was the nearest civilised place where they were out of the power of the local monarch, who was Herod. As a matter of fact, Egypt at the time was a Roman colony and was full of people from all over the known world. There were Romans and Greeks and the native Egyptians, which at the time were what we now call the Copts. And here's a picture of some Copts. Even after uh, uh, a thousand and a half years of Arab influence, Copts still look like Europeans, don't they? Southern Europeans. 
As you see, even now, as I said, they don't look like your standard contemporary North Africans, and they looked even less so at the time of the Romans because the Arabs hadn't invaded yet. By the way, I've just remembered something. Um, the native people who live in the Atlas Mountains, uh, which, which is on the other side of North Africa, you know, the western side, and they are called the High Atlas Berbers. Um, I'll find a couple of pictures for you. Um, they, in uh, the High Atlas Berbers, I inhabiting as they do uh, very isolated areas, escaped much of the more obvious effects of the Arab invasions. Uh, and some of them look extremely, almost Northern European. You'll find blondes there. I'll find a couple of pictures. Okay, so if Jesus's family were in Egypt, it wouldn't be that they'd be blending in. They'd just be one more set of people in a very multicolored and multi-ethnic crowd. But it doesn't mean they'd look one way or the other. Anyway, all I'm saying is that we have absolutely no idea what Jesus looked like. And just assuming he must have been dark skinned and definitely like this mock up shows. Well, no, it's just plain ignorant. He might have done, but then again, might not. Judea at the time was a land bridge between literally hundreds of cultures and for instance, the Hittites are mentioned as living in uh, Judea at the time of King David's kingdom, which is about a thousand years before Jesus. And Hittites were most definitely Caucasians who spoke an Indo-European language. So all of this simply shows Sean King's lack of understanding of history as well as of religion. And then he says, tear them down, which is... Well, it's inciting to violence, isn't it? OK, so King is an ignorant loon. Uh, perhaps he has the excuse of coming uh, from a working class family. I don't know too much about his background, uh, but I'm assuming it was a working class family in America with possibly not the best education to fall back on. And um, that is sort of an excuse in a way. Um, so what's the archbishop's excuse? Within a day of, of that tweet, and I, I'm not even sure that the Archbishop had seen the tweet. It's just part of the, the general atmosphere. Within a day of that tweet, you have the most reverend primate. And when I hear the word primate, which is supposed to mean a, a prime mover in the um, Christian community, uh, I, all I can think of is the other sort of primate now. Anyway, you have the most reverend primate, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, saying this, the Anglican Church should consider the way statues and other representations of Jesus portray him as white in the light of the Black Lives Matter protests. <sighs> Hang on a minute, Your Grace. Although, should I be calling him your grace? He's probably the sort of person who would say, just call me Justin. He said the church must look very carefully to see if they should all be there. Look, if they're there, they're there. And then he actually does make the point. You see a black Jesus, a Chinese Jesus, a Middle Eastern Jesus, which is, of course, the most accurate. Well, we don't know that. I've already mentioned that earlier on, haven't we? Uh, you see this here. Let's get this uh, this thing he said, uh, which, of course, is the most accurate. Well, yeah, you see this here is a problem of Christianity, uh, which I've, I've spoken about to a lot of people at various times, and it's a problem of iconography. When you make pictures of your God, you're tying yourself to a specific type, especially uh, after that God is universalized. Uh, you, you get this disconnect. Now, what he got close to here is that you have 
different pictures of Jesus depending on the different cultures who uh, who are worshipping him. I'll run a few pictures here. There's a, there's a Chinese Jesus, a picture of a Korean Jesus. I know I've got that somewhere and I'll put it up there. I think it's especially fine and shows strong Buddhist influences. There's a Japanese Jesus because, you know, all sorts. But Jesus is supposed to be God. Uh, we, we could make the case that he can look any way he damn well pleases. And what people around him saw might not actually have been what he looked like. Or, or rather, he might have simply looked to each person exactly what they wanted to see in a God. Whatever. Well, we're getting into all sorts of weird theology now. But the point is, arguing that it's racist to portray a Northern European Jesus when he's in Northern European churches. It's about as, well, it's about as daft as arguing that Spanish architecture, which developed to deal with Spanish atmospheric conditions, is nationalist because it's far more often found in Spain than anywhere else. So, as I said, I can understand Sean King not understanding much about theology and the history of Christianity. But, well, perhaps I'm expecting too much. But I really would have thought that the Archbishop would be better informed. So I was talking about this to one of my sons the other day over Skype. And I told him about the Archbishop's comment about the Jesus images. And I quoted what he said, uh, which is as follows. Well be said, some names will have to change. I mean, the church. Goodness me, you know, you just go around Canterbury Cathedral, there's monuments everywhere, or Westminster Abbey, and we're looking at all that, and some will have to come down. Which brought the following question from the journalist that challenged if this meant some statues would be taken down from inside Canterbury Cathedral. He said, well be said, no, I didn't say that. I very carefully didn't say that. Well, with respect, Your Grace, actually, with no respect whatsoever, because you have now lost just about every last shred of respect, still desperately clinging to my tattered image of the Church of England establishment. That's exactly what you did say. A completely hopeless Archbishop of Canterbury, who after a set of published opinions like this, in my poor opinion, shouldn't be running the tea urn after the service, let alone a string of churches. Uh, and when I was mentioning this to my son, he just stared at, into the camera. He stared at me. And then he just, he just banged his head straight down on the desk. And I'm warning you, you see, that's how wokeness gives you brain damage. Why don't you treat yourself or a favoured relative or friend to these magnificent examples of promotional merchandising? The Granny Opteryx t-shirt or the Granbo mug, which comes in two flavours, with a firearm or the more deadly knitting needles. And whatever platform you're watching this on, please click like, subscribe and share, share, share.